A ghost. One dark and gloomy night, I was sitting in my bedroom reading ghost stories. The stories were very scary. A storm was brewing outside my window. The wind began to howl, and the trees shook and bent in the wind. Lightning started to flash across the sky. I felt uneasy as I heard the low rumble of thunder. I glanced around my room. The shadows were deep and dark. The ghost stories were making my imagination play tricks on me. I thought that the shadows were moving. I looked under my bed to make sure that nothing was under there. I hid under the covers and peeked out. I was starting to hear things. A big streak of lightning flashed across the sky, and a loud clap of thunder made me jump. I was very nervous. All of a sudden, I heard a noise. It was coming from my closet. I thought that it must be a ghost. I looked out from under my covers and waited for the ghost to appear. My face was white, and I was very, very scared. Then I heard the noise again. Yes, there was definitely a rustling in my closet. I stayed very still and did not make a sound. I watched the closet and hoped that the ghost would not come flying out at me. Something started to come out of the closet. I squeezed my eyes shut. I didn't dare look at the ghost. I heard it come out of the closet. I felt it jump up on my bed. I was still too scared to look. Then the ghost made a noise. It said, "Meow." I opened my eyes and saw my kitten standing there. It was my kitten that had made the rustling noises in the closet. I laughed and felt very foolish. I have decided not to read ghost stories on dark, stormy nights. I think my imagination plays tricks on me when I read ghost stories on nights like that. Advice to a student from a foreign country. My advice to a student from a foreign country would be to talk, talk, talk. Talk as much as you can to the people who live in the place that you are visiting. Talk to them and practice your new language skills. Learn all the funny sayings and different words that make up their language. Talking is the only way to really learn a language. Listen to people and talk to people. If you talk to people, you will also learn about their culture. I have a friend from Japan. His name is Nori. He often comes to see me just so that he can practice his English. He gets confused about words that sound the same but mean different things. He was asking me about the words "see" and "see." I explained to him that they do sound the same, but they are spelled differently and they mean different things. Nori is learning some of our funny sayings from different people. One morning, I asked him how he was, and he said, "Alive and kicking." Another morning, when I asked him how he was, he said, "So so." He laughs about these strange sayings that we use. He is learning English quickly because he spends a lot of time with English-speaking people. He likes to have lunch with my friends and me because we ask him questions about his homeland, and he answers us in English. If he doesn't understand our questions, we spend time explaining what we mean to him. He says that he enjoys being here. He thinks that the people are very friendly. We enjoy speaking to him and helping him to learn English. We also enjoy learning about his country. It is enjoyable for us to meet new people and learn about new things. Student orientation. Welcome to the University of Newcastle. I'm Caitlin. Now let's welcome Mr. Sutton to give us an introduction of orientation schedule. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, welcome to our university. There are three parts of the orientation during the next week. The first part is the campus tour. We will organise an orientation tour around the campus. Now, please look at the schedule. On next Monday, we will begin our tour with an introduction to the student union. So, please gather at the door of the student union at nine o'clock. 
After visiting the building first, we will help all students to apply for the student union card. So please take one passport photo when you attend the orientation. Usually, there are some departments such as a travel agency, insurance, and so on. You can enjoy your lunch in campus, perhaps at the canteen. At two o'clock in the afternoon, we will all visit the library. A lecturer at the library will give you an introduction: how to apply for a library card, how to borrow reference books, and how to use the facilities in the library. As you know, you will spend lots of time in the library for your future studies, so the introduction is very important for you. On Tuesday, we will visit the computer center. All students can get a username and a passport. You can also register your laptop in the center if you have it. There are some rules of the computer center, especially regarding the use of the printer and the photocopier. After lunch, the next station is the sports center. I am sure you will all be very excited about our facilities. There are also many different societies. You can join in any of them according to your interests and apply for a membership. The second part of orientation is course arrangements. You should gather in the auditorium of the West Campus in the morning of Wednesday. The course coordinator or office staff of your facility will introduce you to the course requirements. First, you will get some information and requirements about compulsory courses, and then optional courses. The faculty often gives students some handouts of course introduction and the different assessments of each subject. Students usually get one or two days to make a decision of optional courses. Of course, I know nearly all students will focus on the assessment. As usual, we have four assessments. Attendance is still the first one. We expect at least eighty percent attendance, and students cannot choose the time. And then all students have to write an assignment, such as an essay. Your personal tutor will give you help for the topic choice, structure, data collecting, and time arrangement. So don't be worried. As a student of the business faculty, all students have to do a presentation, especially group presentations. In which you can train and improve the team spirit. The last assessment is the exam. I know you will all hate it, but you have to attend some exams. Most exams are open book. Isn't it a busy day on Wednesday? You will have a free morning on Tuesday. We hope all students can come to department offices to get a curriculum and hand in your optional course form in the afternoon. The last part of orientation is a party for all new students. The party will be held at five o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. There is a common room on the third floor in the business faculty building. We will prepare for many delicious foods and drink in there, and it will be a good chance to know your advisors and classmates. Okay, that's the main introduction of orientation. I am sure that you will enjoy it. Thanks, Mr. Sutton. The next thing. Marine life. How many fish are in the sea? It's a hot topic for many scientists. Today we have invited a famous scientist who spent ten years studying marine life to give us an introduction of the latest survey called "The Census of Marine Life." Let's welcome Alok Jha. Thanks, Ella. The census of marine life has been the biggest and most comprehensive attempt ever to answer that question: How many fish are in the world's oceans? The census of marine life, which hopes to indicate a baseline of marine life, estimates that there are more than two hundred and thirty thousand species in the sea. The study covers from coast to the open ocean, from the shallows to the deeps. From little things like microbes to large things such as fish and whales, a team of over three hundred and sixty scientists from all over the world have spent the past ten years surveying twenty-five regions, from the Antarctic through to the temperate and tropical seas to the Arctic, 
to count the different types of plants and animals. The findings indicate that crustaceans such as lobsters, crabs, krill and barnacles account for a fifth of the number of species in the world's oceans and half of the world's marine species is mollusk, squid and octopus, and fish, including sharks. The charismatic species usually used in propagating environmental protection, for example whales, sea lions, turtles and seabirds, account for less than 2% of the species in the world's oceans. The study has also focused on major fields of concern for conservationists. In every region, they got the same experience of a major collapse of what were usually very abundant fish stocks or crabs or crustaceans that are now only 5 to 10% of what they used to be. The main reasons include overfishing, degraded habitats, and pollution. But more problems are presented. Rising water temperatures and acidification brought by climate change and the growth in areas of the ocean that are low in oxygen and therefore unable to support marine life. The census of marine life shows that enclosed seas, such as the Mediterranean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, China's shells, Baltic and the Caribbean have the most threatened biodiversity. The pollutions in enclosed seas are mainly from chemicals or garbage that people throw into it. Dense coastal populations of humans also tend to be packed along enclosed seas, meaning rising contaminations and extraction of more biodiversity from the water. The Mediterranean Sea which contains around 17,000 identified species, has been a region with high threat. Scientists in our team studying the Mediterranean identified problems related to increased litter from shipping and munitions across the sea, as well as bombs discharged during the Kosovo War. The Mediterranean also has to face problems with invasive species, displacing the creatures that already live there. The census of marine life shows that the Mediterranean Sea has the most alien species, more than 600, among all the 25 regions that have been surveyed. It looks like the region with coral reefs has always had a very high rate of speciation. It also has a very diverse range of habitats from the deepest regions of the ocean to large reasons of shallow seas which can afford coral reefs. The most diverse regions identified by the Census of Marine Life are around Australian and Japanese waters, which contain more than 30,000 species each, and are among the most biologically diverse in the world. Next in line are the oceans of China, the Mediterranean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Besides algae and the seabirds and mammals that travel around the sea, viperfish has been regarded as the most cosmopolitan marine creature by the census of marine life. Its presence was recorded in around a quarter of the world's seas. And for every marine species of all kinds known to science, scientists of the census of marine life estimate that at least four have yet to be discovered. For example... About 70% of species of fish have been discovered, but for most other groups, likely less than one-third are known. Our research team has found the number of marine fish species was about 16,764 and was growing at around 100 a year. So scientists estimate that there are almost 22,000 fish species in the world's oceans. The most fruitful potential areas for discovery include the tropics, deep seas, and southern hemisphere. Although most ocean organisms still remain nameless and their numbers unknown at the end of the census of marine life, we still gained an important and exciting start. Definitely. That's a great achievement. Thank you very much. OK. Thanks to Alok for giving the amazing information about marine life. Next week we will...